All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, next, we've got a, a panel, I, I, just reading through their bios, uh, Andy's actually going to, to introduce them individually, but this is, I mean, this is experience right here. This is what you talk about, the people that have done it, the people that have seen it. What they're going to talk about now is the state of the union of cybersecurity. Andy Sawyer, and he's got a pretty nice bio too, but he's a CISO for, for a, a, a law firm, uh, Lord & Locke. Is that correct? Locke Lock Lord, the other way around. And, but I'll tell you what, I, would, I want his job one of these days. He was a, is it a CISO actually of, of, of the NFL teams and stuff like that. How cool could that have been? Then he kind of disappointed me because it was like in the 90s when people really didn't know what cybersecurity was. So anyway, with, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Andy. Andy, thank you, sir. Thanks, Bill. Welcome to the Cyber Summit. Um, I have a world-class panel, as Mel mentioned, of, uh, of people up here and so that I don't shortchange anyone, I'm going to read their bios, and you'll be, you'll be so impressed as I was that I thought, hmm, maybe I shouldn't tell them what I do. So uh, first we have Cameron Thorson, who is a partner with KPMG LLG in Houston. Uh, she has served public and private clients across the energy sector for more than 20 years. In that role, she works with clients as they consider processes, controls, disclosures rele relevant to investors, including considering impacts of cybersecurity. In addition to her client service roles, Cameron is passionate about recruiting and retaining talent and is committed to KPMG's Accelerate 2025 efforts to attract, retain, and develop professionally under, underrepresented groups. Tony Saueroff, did I get that right? Yeah. All right is a Deputy Chief Information Security Officer for the Texas Department of Information Resources and the State Cybersecurity Coordinator. Tony has over 29 years of experience in IT and cybersecurity and served in leadership positions with the Federal Judi Judiciary and the U.S. Department of Defense. He began his career as a communications specialist in the U.S. Air Force. George Bunick, is currently the Director of Public Safety and Homeland Security for the City of Houston and was appointed by Mayor Sylvester Turner to this position in March of 2018. Tony uh, George is responsible for the Houston Emergency Center Office of Emergency Management and managing Homeland Security programs. He coordinates the activities of all city departments in preparing for, mitigating, responding to, and recovering from disasters, major emergencies, and special events. George served in the Houston Police Department for 34 years. He promoted through the ranks of police officers, sergeant, lieutenant, captain, assistant chief, and executive assistant chief. He worked in patrol, criminal investigations, internal investigations, special operations, tactical operations, and strategic operations. George also chaired the Public Safety Committee for the 2017 Houston Super Bowl. Jesse Carrillo is Chief Innovation Officer for the Howard Hughes Corporation. Jesse oversees the strategy and operation of the company's innovation and technology platforms across the firm's national portfolio of large-scale master plan communities and mixed-use properties. Prior to joining HHC, Mr. Carrillo served as Chief Information Officer of Heinz, directing all corporate technology, strategy, and standards for the global real estate firm worldwide. He joined the firm in 1994 and served in various technology roles before becoming the company's Chief Technology Officer in 2007 and then the CIO in 2009. Mr. Carrillo is a member of the CIO Executive Council Real Estate Cyber Consortium, CyberHouston.org, and the Wired, Wired Score Smart Building Council. He serves on the advisory boards of Realcom International, Quest Oracle, and the Houston Baptist University College of Science and Engineering, and is president of the Houston chapter of Society, uh, of Society for Information Management. And he serves on the board of Genesis Works, Houston, through which he is a strong supporter of promoting youth and IT. Jesse's not very busy. Steve is overrated. <laughs> uh, Tony Souza uh, joined uh, Centerpoint in September of 2021 as the, as the 
Director of Corporate Cybersecurity. Uh, he leads the company's enterprise-wide information and data asset security program, including risk evaluation, stakeholder engagement, strategy, and operations. He also leads enterprise architecture and cloud. Tony served as an active duty officer in the United States Army for 10 years. He served another 12 years in the U.S. Army Reserve while working in leadership IT roles at Southern Company, GE Power, and managing his own company specializing in cybersecurity for federal agencies. And Tony, I believe you're a West Point grad? That's correct. Okay. That's also pretty awesome. Tony has held several roles leading enterprise information technology and cybersecurity programs within the utilities and other industries. His most recent role was at Duke Energy where he was the Director of Cybersecurity Architecture and Engineering. Tony was also responsible for information and operational technology integration as well as enterprise threat and vulnerability management and third-party risk management. So now you know why I had to read all of that. I wasn't going to remember any of it. We're going to go through and, and ask a series of questions and kind of pace it so that we have uh, the opportunity to take uh, questions from you uh, as we get through the, the process. So I'm going to begin with George. George, uh, what is the federal government doing to assist cities and counties in fighting cyber terrorism? Great. Thanks, and uh, good morning, everybody. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security has allocated $1.8 billion for preparedness uh, grant programs to combat uh, terrorism. And this is to prepare for, prevent, mitigate, and respond to uh, acts of terrorism. DHS has um, designated six national priorities, and um, I'm sure the audience would be glad to hear this. Uh, cybersecurity is actually one of their six priorities. Out of this $1.8 billion, um, the five county, uh, Harris County, Houston region receives $24.6 million uh, to combat terrorism. Most of that money that we use is used to um, use for like SWAT and bomb squad and special response groups, hazmat. But actually, out of that $24.6 million, $1.8 um, we spent this past year in um, cybersecurity related. We hired a cyber uh, analyst for the Fusion Center. We provided cyber training for the, for the Fusion Center. We built a cyber assessment tool for the region to look at and identify gaps to figure out what we need. And then actually one of our most critical ones is we were, um, we, we purchased, um, I, I guess, equipment or software to protect the, um, the regional uh, communication radio system for the five county area, and that's used by police, fire, and other first responders. There's a new uh, DHS grant that, uh, that just came out. Um, they released it in September. It's a $1 billion grant um, for the years 22, 2022 to 2025. And uh, 2020, in 2022 this year, they released 200 million of that 1 billion, and Texas is gonna receive uh, $8 million of that um, security grant funding. Houston, city of Houston is going to uh, apply for uh, some of that. We, we hope to get in excess of, uh, of an additional million dollars that'll be used by our Houston Information Technology Services, our police department and fire department, because those seem to be the um, the, the departments or agencies um, most at risk. So why is this grant money important? Uh, in 2019, there were 23 different cities and counties were taken out by ransomware. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Certainly my partner, Tony, we, we were talking about it. His agency was actually responsible for, for some of the response. Um, so the city of Houston combats, combats and, and monitors, we get thousands, if not tens of thousands of, of, of attacks uh, per day. And our uh, CISO, um, Chris Mitchell, is, is responsible for that with, 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 with his team. The city of Houston also requires uh, cyber awareness training, right? Somebody mentioned it on the earlier uh, presentation. October is Cyber Awareness Training Month. 
So hopefully um, everybody has taken their training. I took mine on Monday, but we all know that the biggest threats are, you know, the human side of this. We, we, we got great computer programs and monitoring and, you know, can kill these attacks. But, you know, the, the weakest link is the employees, so we've got to make sure that, that we're all doing that. Um, the grant money I talked about uh, is, is not sufficient, but it's, it's really going in the right direction. Three years ago, cybersecurity was not, a, was not designated as a national priority. Um, now it is, and I think it's a step in the right direction. Thanks, George. Okay, the next question is for uh, Tony Saueroff. We have two Tonys on the panel here, of course. So um, recognizing that there is a big gap in cybersecurity posture between large entities and small to medium-sized companies, Tony, what can you, uh, can you discuss the need for non-IT leaders to get involved in the conversation about cybersecurity? Yeah, thanks, Andy, and, and <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so as, as state cybersecurity coordinator, um, I spend the majority of my time working with local governments, city states, local government entities like school districts and, and, and other entities like that across Texas. Um, we have 254 counties in, in Texas, 12, oh, over 1,200 cities, over 1,200 ISDs or school districts, not counting all the other public entities that we have out there. Um, and um, the majority of those are, are, are not like uh, Harris County or the city of Houston or SciFair ISD, right? They, you know, they're all on the small to medium sized um, side of that, that group. Um, very, very small percentage are, are the large ones. And, you know, I've seen um, in my time, in my experience working with these folks, that there's a, there's a big gap. There's a, there's, a, there's a large gap between those, those, those folks at the top in size that have mature cybersecurity programs, at least a program, and, and, and no one's perfect, and they're, they're not doing everything that they need to be doing, but they have a program and they're recognizing um, the things that they're not doing um, and, and, ha and have an organized approach to, to what they are doing. But then there's a very large gap, and then there's everyone else, which is, which is the majority of, of, of entities by quantity. Um, that I've seen. Um, I've seen this for a long time. I've been, I've been fighting this and talking about this for a long time. I recently read an article that talked about the, the CPL or the cyber poverty line. Um, uh, Wendy Nather, who works for Cisco now today, coined this phrase. And I learned, uh, we connected and I talked with her and I learned that she actually coined this phrase years ago when earlier in her career, she worked for TEA, the Texas Education Agency. And while she was the ISO for TEA and she worked with 1,200 school districts across the state, she saw the exact same thing and came up with a phrase for it, the cyber poverty line. Um, and and um, so that's what, I, that's what I'm seeing out there is, is and, and I spend most of my time working with entities below that line. Um, because those that are above that line don't need as, as much of the support that we uh, at the state um, can, can provide. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's not all about money, right? The cyber poverty line doesn't mean poverty from a financial sense necessarily. It's, it's where you are from a cybersecurity posture. And um, it's not all about money. And, and for the most part, money is not even, not even the first priority. It's about getting the right folks involved, the right folks involved in the conversation. The, the, the non-IT, the non-technical leadership, the county judges, the commissioners, the mayors, those, those sorts of folks out there, um, believe it or not, we still are battling the, the, the notion that, you know, trying, 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 to, trying, to, trying to educate them that cybersecurity is important, right? And that they are, that they are um, their, their entities are actual um, potential targets. Um, you know, they believe that, that that, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in small town Texas, so, so I'm not a target, right? And we don't have to worry about those things. So, so I spend a lot of my time focusing on, 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 um, uh, on that area of our state. And, um, and I've learned and I've seen that, that, that when you can, when you can, and it, it, the problem goes both ways on, on, from, from the leadership side, those mayors and judges and folks like that, that don't understand and appreciate the importance of cybersecurity. 
and that, that, that they are a threat. And also on the technical side, the, 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 those that do have technical staffs um, that, that, that don't understand how to, to um, communicate the risk, the operational risk in a way that those folks will understand and appreciate, right? Um, so um, I spend a lot of time trying to bring those folks together and, and, um, and I've seen that once you do that, if you can do that, um, bring those folks together and open the eyes to, of, the, of, of, of the leadership folks to, to the things that, that they want to know and need to know, but they don't yet know that they want to know and need to know. And if you can open their eyes to those things, um, good things come from that uh, when it comes to cybersecurity and things can change in a positive way even before it gets to the money conversation. There are things that can be done there. So that has a lot to do with it, you know, for me. That's great. Thank you, Tony. Hey, maybe if this works, I think it does. Um, one thing to add on, I mean, you spoke about it from a, a school district, from governments, from all of that, but it, I see the same in, in layers of companies because I serve public to private, very small, and you see the same lack of awareness, perhaps, and even a fear of the IT uh, language. You, you heard my bio. I'm not, I'm not a techie like, like these guys, but um, you know, I, I've sat in enough discussions and had enough of those IT that I'm not fearful of and not intimidated by. And, and how many maybe of the organizations that you're in, maybe when you talk to the accounting or the operational or otherwise, they have that kind of fear of the lingo, the fear of not understanding of what it is that you're talking about. So I think breaking it down and even giving a little bit of the basics of the impact of, do you want to have access to be able to pay invoices or to get into your accounting system? I think Andy said when he speaks to some of the professionals, he has to tone down the fear level because every time I talk about cyber internal or external, there's a fear level. So maybe thinking about toning the, the fear level down so that someone who isn't as technical is able to hear that. I think those are the things that help bridge the gap, um, even without bringing in somebody else to bridge it. I think it's maybe normalizing some of that discussion and making it frequent so that, that it's a part of the regular dialogue. Just a, just a real quick story I'll add. Uh, that I, know we're, I know we don't have a lot of time, but years ago when I was working for the federal judiciary, um, I was a CISO for the Fifth Circuit, uh, and I would, as I traveled the circuit, uh, I was facilitating some tabletop exercises and, and um, couldn't get anyone to, to participate other than, than IT and, and cybersecurity staff. Um, and, I, and I showed up at one court in Louisiana, federal court, um, and, and the clerk um, wanted to, to, to chat for a minute. The clerk, and, I, and I, I explain this because I didn't know before I worked for the judiciary. The clerk is, is, is who runs the court, right? Everyone works for the clerk except for the judges. Um, the clerk said, um, you know, asked if he could sit in on this tabletop exercise only for about 15 minutes because he had some other things on his calendar. And I said, sure, it's, it's your court courthouse come on you know and and so so we went in and and, and um uh got started and just to keep the story short the clerk ended up staying for the entire tabletop exercise it took about two and a half hours i don't know what he blew off on his calendar that morning but his eyes were opened right his eyes were open to those things that he wanted to know and needed to know but didn't know until that moment that he wanted to know those things and needed to know those things and it changed and that's a different court from a from a cybersecurity standpoint today than it was before that tabletop exercise and it was only because he just decided to sit in for 15 minutes in that conversation. Well, one last thing. Um, we, we talk a little bit about a line between the large enterprises and government and the small enterprises and businesses. And uh, what I would say is why have a line? Those small businesses in most cases are our vendors, they're our suppliers, they're our business partners. And for a large enterprise, hopefully the large enterprises are hard targets for, for adversaries. They're hard to break into. But the easy place for them to go is to your supplier, um, to your business partner that's a small business that maybe has doesn't even have an IT department or has one person that takes care of uh, email or invoicing or whatever it may be. So one of the things that we've done in our, in our vendor risk management uh, area is, is reach out to our partners. And if they're having problems or they don't understand something, we actually help them. It's an investment, but it's an investment that, that pays back in big ways because that way we don't, we lower our own corporate risk um, by lowering the risk on the vendor and supplier side, which in most cases, a lot of those companies are really small. Great discussion team. Uh, next question for Cameron. Um, how will continued focus on cybersecurity risks impact reporting and disclosures to boards and investors? So, I mean, 
We all know, we've heard discussion about how you see differences of the priorities of cyber, the differences of, you know, it's on agendas, dollars being sent, spent there. Well, that's also going to translate into, if you look five years ago, there weren't disclosures in public company filings about cyber incidents because it wasn't mandated in a particular way. And even still, you don't see those specific, specific rules that say it has to be done. Now, there are broad rules that require disclosures about what's material, what has a material risk to a company. But I, what's on the horizon and what's proposed are those rules that will be more specific, as they should be, to cyber incidents, to the nature of systems and vendors that you're relying on for your different IT environments. And so what that's going to translate to is you have more non-technical people like me who are going to be involved in the evaluation of what gets disclosed. And so maybe my advice on that, kind of thinking about this is primarily an IT group, it gets back to thinking about what would be a big deal to you now and talking with your, your different constituents within your organizations about making sure you know what is our plan of attack if there were something? What is our process? And do we have a reporting process? And do we think about how we're going to capture that and what would be relevant for the people whether it's our investors or others, to know about different incidents that are happening. Obviously, you don't want to say the world um, about a cyber incident, but you're going to have to, uh, particularly for public companies, you're going to have to say a lot more than, than you've said in the past. And so thinking about kind of what that would be, your process of going through it, those types of disclosures perhaps have not gone through the same rigor that they have gone through for other financial disclosures. So it's something to think about. I know that's a whole different sort of world than the discussion that we're talking about, but I did want to put it out there because they will come to you all as the IT professionals to help understand it. And it gets back to the lack of the technical understanding to do so. And so you, it's bridging that gap and then making sure that the right information gets disclosed when that does happen, because it's going to be required in more specificity. Thanks, Cameron. Just for a show of hands in the audience, how many of you uh, end up being responsible for reporting your cybersecurity posture to your customers or, or your clients? How many in the audience? Quite a few. I, I can tell you as one of the largest uh, law firms on the planet, that uh, we started uh, being audited by our clients um, probably 10 years ago. And when I got my first questionnaire, I, my initial response was, uh, there's no way I'm answering these questions. <laughs> and, uh, but turns out we are going to answer them and be fully disclosing. Uh, and, uh, and really, I think if you, those that raise their hands, uh, my experience has been that uh, doing the reporting and, and being as self-effacing and transparent as you can be with your clients makes your program better. It certainly has made our cybersecurity program better at Lock Lord. Uh, I can easily go to the board and say, these are the things our clients are telling us we have to do. Uh, and it works. So uh, while initially you think, eh, I don't want to answer these questions, we're not going to look all that great. Uh, my experience, and I think those up here would say, uh, you know, it, it tells you the things you, that you're doing well, tells you what you're not doing well, and how to get better. Anybody else for, for that one? Jesse? Yeah. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I, I think for me, I, I, like, I like answering the questions, and, and I've got some of my team here, because it helps you understand what's in the mind of the folks asking the questions, right? So you start seeing the same question asked over and over again, the same theme, then it helps you kind of focus your attention. Because again, I think it was said earlier, we'll never be able to spend enough money if you're a real target. But, but can we focus on the right things? And so when we do present to the board, you know, we're presenting the top three things that matter to them because the questionnaires have kind of guided us there. So, so again, it takes, it's time consuming, uh, but it is worth the effort when you start seeing you know, themes and threads uh, and going to what Cameron said, I think, you know, the question is, you know, like in your firm, knowing that, that you're going to be doing more of this, are you guys looking at bringing more technical folks in? Or are you thinking, hey, our job is really to kind of bridge the gap and translate more. So we need to know enough to be dangerous, but we don't want to be the techies. Uh, so that'd be interesting to hear your, t your comment on that. 
Yeah, so I think um, it's both, actually. Uh, it's one that we are bringing in more technical resources across every aspect of our organization because that is the way that we are going to continue with how we audit. It's not paper, pencil. It's not just kind of heads down and focus on this small area. So I think it's that, but it's, it's coupled with in even what I do, signing an audit report on you know financial statements of a company being thoughtful and aware enough to be dangerous. Because yes, you know you all are presenting to your boards, but I'm also in those same audit committees and board meetings and need to be able to make sure I'm aware of what the risk is to the financial statements and to the public as a result. And so I think, uh, I know we're gonna, y'all are, diversity was in the discussion in the outset, but thinking about talent, we are still trying, we're competing with you all for talent. That, that's the same talent what we want within our organization to be able to do our job. Um, so yes, it is on both fronts. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, no cyber security summit would be complete without a discussion of Russia and Ukraine. And <laughs> So uh, I do want to touch on that, and really for the first time that I'm aware of in history, uh, cyber attacks were the Marines on the beach first, certainly for the Soviets or for the Russians, they're no longer Soviets, sorry, that kind of dates me, doesn't it? Um, but um, I do want to talk about some of the lessons that we've learned from seeing you know, the Russian offensive against uh, Ukraine uh, fr on the cyber front. So, um, Specific to infrastructure, this, this one's for Tony Souza with Centerpoint here. Tony, what are your takeaways from Russia and from Colonial Pipeline since you're in that industry as well? So Russia-Ukraine Russia, is interesting, and we'll back it up a little bit to December 23rd of 2015. That's when the first attack occurred on the uh, power grid in, in Ukraine. And if you look back and study that event, uh, there are two basic things that that um, that led to the catastrophic um, um, failure of the grid in, in Ukraine. One was unpatched devices that had critical vulnerabilities, and it was over a year that they had gone unpatched. And the second was uh, what we talk about all the time: doesn't matter where we are, somebody clicked on a malicious fish. It was a targeted phishing email went to um, uh, went to the Ukraine power company, and that. Uh, unleash the, uh, the malware that got into the grid. A uh, lot of basic cyber hygiene things not done. It was an, it was an old grid from an infrastructure perspective anyways. Um, but I like to say a lot of times, and I use kind of a sports metaphor for this, is that uh, great teams do the fundamentals well 100% of the time. It doesn't matter whether it's sports or any sort of team event that you can think of. Try to think of um, a world-class organization and ask yourself, do, do they do the fundamentals well? Or are they lousy at the fundamentals, but they've got some really razzle-dazzle, high-tech stuff that they do? Uh, the answer is you don't get there from here without, without doing the fundamentals well. So back in 2015, Ukraine was not doing the fundamentals well on the power grid. You fast forward to 2021, 2022, um, there was a lot of trepidation going into the, to that situation about what would happen on the power grid in uh, Ukraine and the critical infrastructure uh, if Russia attacked. Um, what you haven't heard about is uh, things going down due, due to cyber attack. Tremendous destruction of a phys physical nature, which is tragic, but there hasn't been um, a successful huge attack on uh, Ukraine's infrastructure. Why is that? Because between 2015 and now, uh, they made a bunch of investments they had everything from uh, allies and nation states going in there to help them harden their grid, harden their infrastructure, to private companies, to basically doing the work to, to, um, to harden their grid. And the lesson, the lesson I take out of that is it's doable. If um, you know, we have a lot larger infrastructure in the United States here, um, however, the basic fundamentals remain the same, the, the, basic, uh, the basic hardening. The other takeaway from it is Russia, Ukraine this time around is, as far as I know, it is probably the, uh, the first instance of a crowdsourced cyber war uh, that we've seen in history. Uh, if you look back, say, eight, nine months ago, uh, a lot of the alerts that came out and things that we were focused on were really, um, you know, what if, what if Russia or, or their allies launched something into the U.S.? 
Um, that's really a, kind of a doomsday scenario that uh, if, if they want to take that on, that, that actually under U.S. doctrine allows for a kinetic response going back the other way. Um, the thing that's actually more worrisome is both sides in that equation invited anybody on the planet, because the way the internet and everything works now, to say, hey, come on, we'll, we'll give you the tools. If you've got a computer and you've got time, um, help us attack the other side. Uh, that's much more worrisome because when the two countries are going at each other from a cyber perspective, that's very targeted, tends to stay in the theater in co of combat, but uh, somebody sitting in the basement at 3 a.m. that can download some very sophisticated cyber, malicious cyber tools to go try, try to attack Russia, Ukraine, whichever side they, they tend to align themselves to, uh, that gets out in the wild, that can cause problems for everybody. So that, that ties back to the... Um, that ties back to the original point that we always have to be doing the fundamentals well uh, to guard our infrastructure. And then on Colonial, Colonial is another great example. I'm not going not gonna to pick on them. Everybody's probably done the, enough of that already. Um, but just if you look at the nature of the attack itself, it wasn't anything particularly exotic. It was a ransomware attack, not on the actual gas pi uh, pipeline side, but really on the business side. Uh, but again, triggered um, by basic fundamental cyber things that we should all be doing at all times. And that led to, obviously, a pretty big event in the United States. Jesse, Jesse from uh, Commercial Real Estate, what are the lessons learned, the takeaways from Russia, Ukraine? Well, again, um, Howard Hughes, being a master plan community, we basically build cities. And so we, we start with dirt, and then we have to lay the pipe with, with working with other companies. And so, so we are always looking at, like, how do we make sure that, that we future-proof Right. And again, the lessons learned from from Colonial, from you know, learning from Centerpoint and other companies like that. And how do we make sure they were laying the solid foundation? I, I love the foundation comment Tony made, because that is the way we look at how we develop a master plan communities, our office towers, our multifamily. Uh, I think for me, the, the, the bigger concern is around the IoT. Uh, you know, it, it was mentioned earlier. You know, we're, we're all trying to read sensors. We're all trying to figure out how people are using our spaces. I'm sure every industry is using sensors for their automation and, and just to get collect more data. Uh, and I think that's the area that, that you know, we're, we, we're concerned because a lot of the manufacturers, uh, you know, we're designing these systems, building control systems, HVAC systems, well before some of the cyber. And so, so how do we get them to really bake it from the, on the front side, right? Instead of thinking about cyber after the fact. Uh, and so I think that's the area that, that, that as we start building our, our, our new, you know, call it the city of the future, smart city, is we're gonna need a lot of sensors, we're gonna need a lot of automation. And so, so how do we push the industry to make sure that they're focused? Uh, you know, one of the things you mentioned in my bio is the real estate cyber consortium is made, of, made up of a bunch of uh, commercial real estate companies and, and we get together several times a year to talk about cyber around our buildings, operational. Uh, and so again, you know, to me, you know, I love the idea of building these smart cities and they can kind of think, you know, but, you know, as, as we saw earlier when Mel mentioned on the, on the AC, uh, you, know, it, you know, you don't want that, to, you know, automatically go out, you know, because some sensor decided it's going to shut down the AC, right? And so I think how do we make sure that, that we work with the manufacturers, especially in IoT devices, to make sure that they're as hard as possible is, is I think what keeps me up at night. Great. Thank you, Jesse. Anyone else on uh, lessons learned from Russia, Ukraine? Well, let's move on. We have some general questions to ask uh, for, the, for the panel. And then if you would like to uh, weigh in, feel free, raise your hand. We have a couple of folks with microphones around the, uh, the auditorium. Um, first question, how do we attract and retain cyber talent? And um, who knows what uh, FANG is an, ap uh, an acronym for in the audience? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four. So we're all fighting against FANG, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google for our talent. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, they, they love to come in and once you've established, uh, you've given the skill set and you've worked with people, they'll just come in and pay them an ungodly amount of money that you can't possibly compete with and off they go. So um, for the panel, how do we attract and retain cyber talent and what cyber expertise is available to small and medium-sized businesses that maybe can't have a full-time person on staff? Well, at, at the state, we're seeing it, Andy, you know, um, 
we're, 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 it's, it's hard to, to recruit folks for interviews. And, and um, when we get to a point where we can make an offer, um, it's, it's declined. They've, they've accepted another offer or a better offer. So, um, and, it's, and it's more difficult, you know, at a, at a, as a government entity. You don't have the flexibility with, with pay. That, that private sector organizations have, right? So um, it's about, um, you know, focusing on the potential. Um, and and the, the, the first speaker talked about um, some of that recruiting from within or moving up from within. And I thought, you know, a lot of that, you know, with some organizations is, is a necessity, right? Because um, you've got to identify, you know, who has the potential to do this because the, the qualified folks that, um, that um, you know, might be out there just aren't applying. Um, so um, it's, it's being creative, right? It's being creative, especially um, when you don't have the, um, you can't compete um, financially with those, with those large organizations. Um, I'll mention specifically um, uh, w one tool for, for small organizations, because it's, I, I, back to working with the local government entities out there across the state, it's, a lot of it is getting creative and how to, how to work together. And, and um, you know, we don't have, even if they could pay the salaries, there aren't enough cybersecurity professionals out there for all, all of these numbers of entities to have their own staff. Um, we've got, a, um, we've got a, the, te the Texas ISAL, the Information Sharing and Analysis Organization, is something that, that I talk a lot about. And, and um, it's open to um, all private and public sector entities based in Texas. Um, and it's free, uh, free membership. Um, just, just, just submit the form on DIR's website. And uh, we send out a lot of, of, of news and alerts and updates and bulletins. We have a monthly meeting um, via Zoom where we have speakers um, that U UTSA provides an educational brief every month, and Texas A&M provides a, uh, a technical threat intel brief every month. Um, and what we've also started recently, um, just in the last couple of months, sharing some threat intel that um, that the state's SOC uh, harvests themselves. We can't share share uh, threat intel that we're paying for from 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 licensed uh, third-party companies. Um, due to licensing regulations, um, but we can share the intel that, that we're kind of creating ourselves. And, and so we're trying to do those things, and, and um, I'll throw that out, just something, you know, getting creative and looking for, looking for anything out there that um, is available. Um, the, the Texas High style is a good one for, for those, those small entities. Great. Jesse? Uh, yeah, just real quick. I mean, I think, you know, a shameless plug here, but the Houston.org Association, we put some information out online, uh, you know, how to kind of assess yourself, you know, resources, how to protect yourself from a small, you know, mid-sized perspective. So again, I encourage you to look at Houston.org and some of the material we have there. Uh, we try to update it on a regular basis, but you know, we've got a little behind with the craziness the last couple of years. But I think going back to w the comments were made earlier about, you know, from Lone Star College, we've got our friends here at HPU. Um, I think I think partnerships with the universities, partnership with some of these high schools that are focused on cybersecurity is key. Right, because again, we're not going to compete against the the Netflixes, the Amazons, the Googles. I mean, they have so much money they can throw at these. But can you get someone really excited? You know, coming out, they're starting their career. Give them the opportunity. Give them some mentorship. Give them some inter 